All right, so we are gonna get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Esten, and I am the project manager for Scribes of the Chiroganiza. And I wanna thank you all, everywhere from where you're coming, all over the world for joining us today. Um, as long as so you're joining me, as well as our co-hosts at Columbia University Libraries, including Michelle Chesner, Emily Rundy, and Peter Majerski. Um, if you've been on the talk boards on Zooniverse, I'm the person behind at JudaicaBH. Um, so the person sending emails, uh, answering your questions, and providing the day-to-day -day support. Uh, but if you're brand new to our community, I want to thank you all so much for joining us. It's so exciting every time uh, events happen with this project to bring in all these new interested people. And especially for today, joining us for this transcribathon slash presentation event um, with everything going on in the world, it's so great to be able to have a space where people can come together and contribute. Um, so I know there are a lot of new people joining us today, so we're going to use this as an opportunity to give a brief overview of the project, talk about what it does, what we've accomplished, what's coming next. Um, then Michelle Chesner from Columbia is going to talk a little bit about everything that happens at Columbia University Libraries and their collections, specifically with the uh, Jewish history collections. And then we're going to take the time to walk through the site and get started with transcribing. So we think it's going to be about an hour of presentations. And then in the second hour, we'll have this space open uh, where you can chat, ask questions, have it as Q&A, or just have it on in the background as you're working on the site. So I'm going to share my screen. I'll just add throughout that if you have any questions, um, a few of us are monitoring the chat. So even though uh, one person will be talking, if you need any anything, just let us know in the chat and we'll see if we can help you. Here we go. Can everyone see it? All right. Um, so here we have for today's agenda, so introduction to the project, show and tell, Q&A, and then we're going to try transcribing. So for background, Scribes of the Kairoganiza is an international collaboration project that was launched in August 2017. And what we're doing is inviting the public to sort, transcribe, and tag digitized Geniza fragments to make them classified by script type and content, so whether they are Hebrew or Arabic, um, make them machine readable and available for textual analysis. Um, since the project launched in 2017, We've had over 280,000 classifications on Zooniverse. Um, over 45,000 fragments have been sorted into Hebrew or Arabic. And we've had over 9,500 volunteers participate in the project. Uh, and uh, most of those people have registered on Zooniverse as participants, which is really incredible and amazing. And those numbers are increasing every day. Uh, like a lot of the projects on Zooniverse, we've seen a huge increase since the um, uh, pandemic has begun, which is really incredible to see that many people coming into this space and getting involved. Um, so if you're totally new to the project, you might be wondering what exactly a Geniza is. So the term is often used as storage or repository. It can also mean to hide or put away. Um, and it's really a container or storeroom. So in Jewish tradition, any text that contains the name of God cannot just be thrown away. Um, it has to first instead uh, be placed in a Geniza uh, before it is used for proper burial. So most synagogues have a Geniza somewhere in the building. Uh, you'll put something like Torah scrolls in there. You might bring a ketubah or marriage contract, um, other religious texts. Uh, and this picture on the right is actually a diorama of, uh, from the Museum of the Jewish People in Tel Aviv of the Cairo Geniza. So the, Cairo, the Geniza being uh, this little storeroom right up here. Um, so they would be putting damaged materials inside. Now the Cairo Geniza is really unique because while typically a Geniza only hosts uh, religious materials, the Cairo Geniza had lots of other things inside it. 
Um, and it's known for its like sheer amount of how many fragments it has inside. So it ranges from the 9th century to the 19th century of the Common Era. Um, so this 1,000 year period, um, there are over 300,000 fragments in there. Um, and they vary between religious texts as well as documentary or everyday texts. So we found things like grocery lists, you have uh, legal documents, you have letters, you have children's school books, um, you have practice doodles, materials, pretty much anything you can think of that would have been written down in this period is going to be found in the Cairo Geniza. And we find that not only are there just materials that are written in Hebrew, but things that are written in Arabic. Uh, you have materials in Persian or Judeo-Persian, uh, Ladino or Judeo-Spanish. So you have uh, lots of different languages and scripts in there as well. It is the largest and most diverse collection of medieval manuscripts in the world. And it's really important for researchers because it gives insight into the Jewish Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, and North African history. Uh, it allows researchers to understand how Jews participated in the contemporary society, what their lives, culture, and languages were like, and the social and economic implications. And this Wait, is- Can, I, can yeah. I interrupt? There were a couple of questions. Sure. Um, one was, is the image on the screen from the Shul in Fustat? Yeah, so it is from the uh, Ben Ezra Synagogue in Fusat, um, which is where the building of the Cairo Geniza were originated. Okay, thanks. Yeah. There was a hand raised, but I'm not sure. Um, let me, uh, Mud, I'm gonna unmute you. You wanna share your question? Uh, I was asking about, uh, shall we, uh, Log in uh, the, the site, Scribes of Cayo Geniza, uh, while we are watching this presentation, or just uh, watch the, the, presentation, the presentation? Not yet. So first, Emily is going to talk about the project, and then we're going to move to the site afterwards. OK. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and feel free to add questions to the chat, um, and Michelle can refer them, or raise your hand, and we can do that as well. Yeah. Um, so you might be wondering how things got from the Cairo Geniza to our project. And so the Cairo Geniza remained largely intact as far as we know until the late 19th century. Um, it started drawing a lot of attention from scholars, uh, one in particular Solomon Schechter, who was a scholar at Cambridge University. So he made an expedition to Egypt where he worked alongside the chief rabbi to sort and take away some of the greater parts of the Cairo Geniza that he thought were particularly interesting for his work. Um, and Orientalists, traders, collectors, and scholars really took interest into these fragments for their own collections. So today, the Cairo Geniza fragments can be found in collections throughout the world, uh, as far away as St. Petersburg, Russia, to Los Angeles, California, and the United States. Um, the majority of them are at the Cambridge uh, University Libraries, about half of the fragments. Um, but we have included in our project fragments that are located at Columbia University Libraries, the Bodleian Libraries at the University of Oxford, the University of Manchester Library in the United Kingdom, the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in New York, um, the National Library of Israel, and the University of Pennsylvania Libraries, uh, where I work and where this project is based. And in the 90s and the early 2000s, a majority of these fragments were digitized through the Friedberg Geniza Project. So we have lots of these images and our project came together as a way to start using these images and think about what can we do to make them accessible to researchers now. Um, and so we're really excited about the idea of crowdsourcing, right? So one of the things that crowdsourcing allows us to do is introduce the story of the Geniza and these materials to the public. These are uh, documents and fragments and images that most people don't get to see, but as you all know, are really interesting and exciting to a wide number of people. And we think that everyone can contribute in some way and provide more information about what we're looking at. So our project comes in two phases. So uh, the first phase is the sorting phase, and you can see the video on the right is kind of walking you through the process. Um, but we ask volunteers to answer questions regarding the script type, so whether it's Hebrew or Arabic, uh, formality, so whether it is formal or informally written, 
we ask about features of if it's part of a book. So if we want to know if this fragment was once part of something else. And then we ask for other visual features, like does it have a colon? Um, are there any tears on the page? Any specific visual features that'll help us learn more about what this fragment is. And then once it's been sorted by script type, uh, we have these different categories. And then we have the difficulty of the script, whether it's formal or informal. And we move into the transcription phase. So we launched the transcription page just over a year ago. Um, and those categories of formal and informal become easy and challenging. So we have easy Arabic, uh, challenging Arabic, easy Hebrew, and challenging Hebrew um, for people to go in and transcribe. So again, we have a little video over here on the right that's gonna load and show you what transcription looks like. And we'll go through that a little bit later. But what we have is each uh, fragment is transcribed line by line. Each line is transcribed three times by a person. And then those transcriptions are compared. If they're really close, a three of three is what we say, they're exact, then it is finished. And we use that as the transcription. If it's more complicated, there are more mistakes, people vary, we go up to seven times. And one of the things we've done here is we've designed custom Hebrew and Arabic keywords. So if you are totally new to this or you're really having trouble identifying what those letters are when you're looking on the screen, you can identify them by matching them to the keyboard exactly. So an Aleph in one script of Hebrew might look a little bit different depending on who was writing it, where they're coming from, where they were trained. And so it's really a picture matching process. Um, so at this point in our project, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what's next for us. So we released our first round of data earlier this year. So for the first 40,000 fragments that were included in the project from Cambridge, Penn, and uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, um, all of that crowdsourced data is now available for everyone to look at, and I'm happy to release that link later on in the chat. Um, but what we have there are all the tags people have added, whether it's written in Hebrew or Arabic, whether a fragment has a particular uh, visual characteristic, um, all of that information. And we're just starting to get into it with researchers of what that looks like and what we can do with it. We're also working on launching new and improved workflows. So we've taken a lot of feedback from what we can improve upon when we're asking sorting questions. Um, we're trying to get a sense of what languages these are written in, so something that is written in Hebrew, uh, as many of you know, might not be written in the Hebrew language, but might be written in Arabic or something else. And so we're putting together a workflow specifically for that question. Um, and we're also going to have a phrase finder for so those really difficult informal texts that are hard to read. Instead of going straight in and transcribing, we're going to have you look for really specific characters at a time. And then finally, we have researchers who are starting to use the crowdsourced transcription data that's been uh, generated over the past year. So over here on the right, we have uh, team members from a hackathon in Haifa, Israel, and they use some of the early uh, transcription data to build a um, uh, to build a script that would compare the transcriptions to texts that are available on Safaria, which is an open access uh, list of various Jewish texts. Um, and that way we could see what, uh, we could identify what a particular fragment is just based on the transcription, and we could compare it to the existing texts today. So have things changed over time? Um, what mistakes is the scribe making? So we might be able to say, you know, why was this text thrown out? Was it damaged or was it, you know, a mistake someone made at the point? Um, which is really exciting and we hope to see as we get more transcriptions, what else we can do with the crowdsource data that we have. And um, as we mentioned before, so you can always go on the website at scribesofthecairoganiza.org and join in. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Michelle. Um, so I'm just here to talk about the, the Columbia piece of it. Columbia actually relatively has a small collection compared to some of the others. The largest are at Cambridge and the Jewish Theological Seminary. Um, Columbia's collection has about 35 or so Geniza fragments, so really orders of magnitude less than um, the tens and maybe even hundreds, tens of thousands, I would say, of fragments at these other institutions. Um, that being said, we're, we're proud of the few that we have, and we, we know where they came from. Um, <clears throat> Columbia's collection actually 
has been around since the inception of Columbia. Um, Columbia was founded in 1754 and Hebrew was taught at Columbia uh, by its founder, actually Samuel Johnson. And so we've been collecting Hebraica and Judaica from the founding of the university. Um, in there were there were many different times at which we we acquired material, um, but the the foundation of our collection was was in 1892 um, when Temple Emmanuel donated a large uh, collection that they had purchased uh, a few decades earlier um, <clears throat> to Columbia. And then, so that was our, our first sort of solid donation. Um, but then in 1930, all sorts of good things uh, for Jewish studies at Columbia happened, um, beginning with the hiring of Salah Baron, who's known as the father of Jewish history, um, <clears throat> of modern Jewish history. So when Salah Baron was hired, it was actually two years after an endowment had been put in place for his position. And he, uh, hit the ground running. He was a historian. He was very interested in primary sources. And he was coming to America, a country that had not a lot of primary sources for Jewish history compared to where he had been in Europe, um, in Vienna. So he called his friend, he didn't call, there were a lot of letters that he wrote between um, his, his Luntzman, as, as it were, an old friend from Vienna named David Frankel. David Frankel was a book dealer in Vienna who over the course of the 30s was realizing, sort of seeing the writing on the wall and realized that maybe it was time for him to get out of Vienna. And so he wrote, <coughs> there was a lot of correspondence back and forth between Baron and Frankel. And Frankel ended up basically selling his entire collection of Hebrew manuscripts, which was about 700, his stock, 700 manuscripts at the time um, to Baron for Columbia. So in the two years between the endowment that was given for Baron's hire and the um, and when Salah Baron was actually hired, there had been some money that had built up in the endowment, and Salah Baron turned to use that money for collections. So we are very grateful for what we have um, because Salah Baron continually, continuously throughout his tenure at Columbia, felt uh, continued to build Columbia's collections because how can he study history without the primary sources of history? So of the collections that he, of, of this large uh, cache of manuscripts that he purchased from David Frankel were these, uh, these 35 or so Geniza fragments. Now, even within those 35, uh, there, there's now, um, the Cairo Geniza, of course, is the, when people say Geniza, they're talking about Cairo, but there has been in recent years talk about a European Geniza. Um, <clears throat> and that is where Hebrew manuscript fragments have been reused to bind books, both Jewish and Christian. So because parchment was rare and expensive, um, early medieval and early modern uh, book binders were care recycled, essentially. So sometimes it was manuscript that was set discarded because it was in the same way that a Geniza would be. Um, because it was no longer fit for use for various reasons or it had mistakes. Sometimes it was manuscripts that were confiscated um, by the church from Jews, and so they were conveniently available with their parchment for use. And um, one of the, the main finds of these is in, um, in Italy, there was a, a municipal archives where uh, of rows and rows of um, ledgers were rebound in the same Hebrew manuscript. So the, the scholar who was working on this project, Mauro Parani, actually was able to reconstruct the manuscript because it was page by page, book by book. Um, they simply took each a new page for every book they were binding. Um, so some of what we had initially thought were Geniza fragments are actually binding fragments from this, um, from this other quote unquote Geniza um, that came out of Europe. But we do have some actual <laughs> legitimate um, Gen Cairo Geniza fragments, which is excited. Um, our oldest ones are indeed from the 10th century, um, including uh, a fragment of Talmud and some works by Saadia Gaon. So it's, it's really wonderful. Um, I just want to thank El Emily for including us in this, in this uh, project today. Um, and we're looking forward to see what we'll, what we'll find no matter where the collections are based. So thank you. 
Yeah, so at this point, do um, if anyone has questions, you can drop it in the chat and Michelle and I can answer them for you. Um, I think one thing I wanted to add to Michelle's point is that all of the Columbia fragments have been digitized and are available on Internet Archive for viewing. Um, so if you wanted to go through and see them uh, image by image, how they are um, presented at Columbia, as opposed to within the Zooniverse interface, you are only seeing one page at a time. Um, so that's always really exciting to check out. Let me see if I can, um, I'll drop that link in the chat. It's all of our digitized Hebrew manuscripts. So it's yeah. not only the Geniza fragments, it's a lot of different things. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and add that so that uh, people can take a look if they'd like. You don't have to wait for me. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I think adding on that, I think one of the things that is really exciting about looking at a Cairo Geniza fragments or about um, Geniza fragments in general is the variety of things that you find. Um, it's really fascinating to see. Yeah, one of the most surprising findings to me has been um, looking at marriage contracts over time. They're really beautiful in this area, uh, especially you see sort of the early ones tend to be just the text. And then as you move on towards the 19th century, you get these really elaborate designs. Um, and they're also really intimate ways of looking into a person's life and into a couple's life. So there might be really specific um, uh, sentences talking about what provisions are required as part of a marriage, um, whether a couple has children coming into a marriage is always really fascinating. Um, amulets are really cool because they tend to be really visual. There's one that's particularly popular um, that is mass produced amulets. So typically an amulet would be personalized for whoever it's for. And in this case, what they've done, what the person did was create one sheet with lots of tiny amulets. Um, so it just has a picture of the scorpion, some text on it, and they could just you know, clip off a piece, personalize it, and then give it to whoever was purchasing it, which is really exciting. Um, somebody noted that some of the fragments uh, he was working with are uh, have truck notes, have the cantillation marks, and wasn't sure how to identify them. Yeah, so we, um, we typically just ask people whether or not it has cantillation. Um, and then within transcription, we are not keeping that as part of the transcription at the moment, um, mostly because we think it can be really complicated for people to transcribe that. But it's really helpful to know that they exist on a fragment. Um, um, I've also, I've added a, just an image of a ketubah from a Kurdish, what was part of a Kurdish area, it's now part of Iraq. Um, and that's, that's a fragment that we have. Another question was what percent fragments have had text deciphered or matched to other fragments? And how is work in computerized writer identification assisted your project? Yeah, those are great questions. So I think, um, depends on what you mean by text deciphered, but I think about 10% of the entire Geniza, so the you know, um, 300,000 fragments that are included have been identified. Um, and in our project, we have transcribed at least one line of about 300 of uh, our fragments. Um, and so computerized writer identification is something that the team at the University of Haifa, who is involved in our project, is really working on. They have a project called Kraken, which is uh, identifying um, Hebrew text. It's really <laughs> amazing, and I highly recommend checking it out. Um, but one of the yeah. things you have to do with computer uh, text recognition is just training it to be able to recognize those things. So crowdsourcing is actually one way of helping the computer get to the point where they can recognize specific characters for letters. Um, so another question was on Yiddish, other non-Hebrew or Arabic languages in the, in the collection. So Yiddish is Hebrew characters, so that might be a different question, but are you, I, I'll add to the Yiddish question is, are you finding uh, Roman texts as well, Roman character texts as well? 
Yeah, so I think we found, um, and the number off the top of my head, so about 1% of the fragments in our project were out of scope. So that meant either they're way too difficult for someone to even possibly transcribe, or they're in a language or script that is not Hebrew or Arabic. Um, so we are not transcribing them at this time, but we have those all together in one place so that we can identify them and send them off to another person. Um, and one thing that we are working on is trying to identify uh, texts that are written in Hebrew script but are not the Hebrew language, so things like Yiddish, um, in order for us to, again, separate those out, have them available for transcription at another time, but be able to go back and focus on those that are just Hebrew. Okay. Uh, um, somebody asked what an amulet is? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so an amulet uh, is typically, it's an object that has um, sort of like a good luck charm. It's you know, conferring protection on the person that has it. Um, so a lot of the amulets that you'll see in the Geniza are a piece of paper that might have a drawing. They'll have really specific text that uh, gives off uh, you know, some sort of protection to the user. So whether that's protection from sickness, protection from evil, from or protection for good, uh, you'll find lots of small things like that. So if you think of like a rabbit's foot is sort of a type of amulet that you think of in modern age. Um, somebody asked for the link to Kraken. So I'm putting it in there, but I'll note that there, Kraken is a, is a, um, software that was was created for many different scripts. So the group that's working in, in Haifa are specifically working on Hebrew scripts, but it's been used in a lot of different contexts um, for manuscripts. It's not only a Hebrew um, transcription project. And there's a there's a link to their GitHub files there as well. So if somebody's uh, technically savvy and wants to try it out themselves, uh, all that information is there. Um, I have a question that was sent to me of, have any of the partial fragments found missing pieces to form a bigger fragment? And yes, actually, there have been a couple examples. One that I know of off the top of my head is from Cambridge and from uh, the Bodleian libraries, and there are two parts of the ketubah. And one part, the part at Cambridge, had been written on a lot, like there was a lot of discussion and lots of research papers, and the one at the Bodleian had not been written about at all, and one scholar was able to connect them. Uh, which is really exciting. Um, there have been lots of other uh, connections, of, particularly of pages that are linked, so we can tell that these two fragments were part of the same book at one point. Um, and it's not something we focused on in our project, but other researchers are trying to find ways of how can we um, find, how can we use technology to better connect or find the relationships between texts that exist within the Geniza. And I think that was done in a in a preliminary way on the on the Freeburgenisa project when they first started. I remember they they imaged the materials when they wanted to to photograph our Geniza fragments. They specifically wanted to photograph them on this special blue paper um, because it was sort of like a green screen where they could connect. So they could they had the computer see if the edges of the puzzle pieces, as it were. Uh, would connect to other puzzle pieces. And the yeah. original Friedberg site allowed people to take two manuscripts and see if they connected together um, in really interesting ways. Um, somebody pointed out the, the existence of the done and talk section. So for things like Trump um, or other aspects of a manuscript that don't have um, fields in the system itself, you can add, uh, you can definitely bring that into the talk boards. And Emily, you could talk about that more for sure. But I, I it sounds like there's a tremendous amount that's been done there. Yeah, um, we can definitely talk about that later. But that's a great space to put things and questions or anything that's related to a fragment that we don't specifically ask, but you have the knowledge of. And one of the things that's really exciting about doing a crowdsourcing project is people always have more insight than, you know, than I do, than researchers do, than other volunteers do. Yeah, um, just, oh yeah, yeah. Just to the diversity of the people working on it really means that that there's added value sort of from everywhere. I mean, the fact that people all over the world with different skills are able to work on this, um, everybody, everybody really gains. Um, another question was about literacy. The question was, do the texts show a high level of literacy among all classes of people? That's a great question. So I don't, um, I don't know what the official researcher standpoint would be, but I believe so. Yes, there is a wide variety of um, 
of class discussed within the Geniza. You see people who are of upper class that are being discussed, but you also see, I, I know there is an article in particular that's coming to mind of like the poorest person that is mentioned in the Geniza compared to the richest person that is mentioned in the Geniza. Um, so you do see a wide range. And I think there is definitely um, lots of materials that come from uh, children as well. So people who are just learning to write and transcribe. So that's always really exciting to see. So you do see a wide range of literacy, of learning, um, of class as well. Um, I'll add, I, I actually, I was, I was working on a presentation that I gave last night on, on Haggadot through history, and um, I was pointed out to actually a scholar of the Geniza, um, Professor Eve Krakowski at the University of Princeton, um, told me about this, this Haggadah that she stumbled upon, which was, um, so the Passover Haggadah that's used for the Seder, um, on Passover night was actually not a codex, but rather a roll. So it was a long strip of paper that had the entire text of the Haggadah in it, and somebody would have unrolled it as they read through it. Um, and this was a, it was a Taylor Schechter uh, manuscript. So it was, a, it was a Cambridge, it was from the Cambridge collection. Um, and the, the reverse of it actually was a letter that somebody wrote about an uprising in Alexandria. So it was uh -huh. a cheap piece of paper. It was fast writing. We're not talking about a fancy illuminated manuscript here. This was somebody needed to write down the text so that they could do what they needed to do at the Seder. But at the same time, I'm not sure which was written before, whether the letter was written before or the Haggadah was written before. And so I think you see a lot of the, the reusing of, of paper. I mean, these were scrap. So people used both sides of the paper because paper is not always easy to get. So you see very much the, uh, I mean, what's wonderful about the Geniza, and I'm sure many of you know this, is, is how human it was. These are not elites for the most part. These are everyday people writing, you know, letters to their friends and colleagues in many cases. Yeah. Um, somebody asked a question about uh, transcription accessibility for disabled scholars, and if there's any been any work done with the Geniza project on accessibility. Yeah, there hasn't been anything um, specific with our project, although with um, the generation of transcription through crowdsourced um, production, we will have things that are machine readable and will be accessible to disabled scholars. But I don't know in the field at large if that has been a conversation. Um, and then another question was, if we transcribe something wrong, does that set you back and does it matter? Should people worry about making mistakes? Uh, so that's a great question and it's a really exciting one or really exciting one for me because that's, that's part of the value of crowdsourcing because we have people look at every line three times or because in sorting we have people look at a fragment five times. If you make a mistake, there are other people who are going to look at it as well. And it's good for us to know sort of what um, what the variety looks like from participants. So we know during transcription, we have people who don't read Hebrew next to people who do read Hebrew. And it's really great for us to be able to compare, is this something that is easy to read um, for someone who's coming at it? So if you make a mistake, that is totally okay. Um, we have some of the researchers and scholars who have looked at the transcriptions who can say, oh, you know, this one is clearly a mistake because it's not a word, but they can go back and see, okay, like the majority of the word is there so we can get a sense of what it is. What we want is at least a really bare minimum of a transcription that we can start with and improve upon. So if you make a mistake, totally okay. That's one of the joys of crowdsourcing. Um, and one of the, one of the things that um, the, the curator for Judaica, Penn, has said to me many times about the, this project is that it's, it's really just learning to read. We're all learning to read. Um, and, you know, we all think we, we read and then we're presented with that manuscript that was on Emily's screen. And I know Hebrew quite well. Um, and yet, if you don't know that particular script, it's, it's really, really difficult. Um, which actually leads me to another question. Um, I don't know Hebrew at this point in the project. At this point in the project, should I be trying to help? Yeah, so one of the things that we value is if you don't know Hebrew, we uh, really encourage you to try out the transcription aspect, but that's why we also have the sorting there. So you can always go back and do something that is um, really accessible and easy to do. And at this point in the project, yes, we always need more sorters. I think we have uh, still about 10,000 fragments at the moment to be able to sort through. Um, and we will always have new things to transcribe. Hebrew and Arabic, right? 
Yes, yeah, we have Hebrew and Arabic. Yeah. Um, so we, we're going to be adding fragments from the National Library of Israel in a couple weeks. Um, and we're hoping to get more Geniza collections all the time. So our goal is there will always be something available for people who want to sort, and there will definitely always be something available for people who want to transcribe. Yeah, and I, I, I would point out just the, the keyboards that, they, that you guys have made with the, for the transcription, um, it's really shape uh, recognition. So you can see if the shape of the letter looks the same. I wonder if not knowing um, the alphabet gives you a little bit of a uh, leg up because you don't expect the letter to look the way it would look in your modern printed square and you can match it with the, the text. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that, I mean, it's, it's like matching triangles to triangles or, you know, other, other kinds of shapes. Yeah, exactly. That's the idea. I know um, I haven't heard from someone who's like necessarily had trouble using that one, but I know a lot of people um, at Penn when we do transcriptions together, uh, the first thing is like, let me find a keyboard where I can really try to match things and which ones are easy for me to read through. Yeah. Somebody asked, um, do you have a preference? Do you need more sorters or transcribers at this point? Um, Honestly, I think we really need both. Uh, we always, uh, we have things that are for sorting. I think right now, um, getting people involved in transcription can be really daunting. And so it's events like these where we kind of sit down and can walk people through the process. It uh, gets people more on board, but both are always helpful. Somebody asked if they can choose to only transcribe one script or the other. So in this case, the question was, can one choose to only transcribe Arabic? Yes, so we have the workflows are separate, so you can only be transcribing Arabic fragments or you would be only transcribing Hebrew fragments. Um, there isn't a combined space. That's it from my end for questions. I yeah, that's all anything. I see. That's all I see as yeah. well. Um, uh, when will scholars have available material to add to SD Goitan's uh, uh, Mediterranean Society? Um, that's a great question. Uh, hopefully, once we have enough transcriptions for people to work with, there will be things to add. I know um, it's not our priority to add things to uh, Friedberg, um, but that's going to be an option at some point. So in the Friedberg Geniza project, scholars can add their own notes or information and we'll have that as well. Um, and then, so everything that will be produced will also be going straight into the Princeton Geniza Labs uh, resource. So anything that they have documented in their database, which I believe uh, is open to the public or will be open to the public as they're improving upon it. Um, so all that information will be there for scholars to make use of and hopefully create their own research material out of. And then is there Rashi script in the Geniza? Yes, there is. <laughs> So Rashi script is really, it's based on a, what's called Rashi script, which is the script in which Rashi's commentary on the Bible is now printed, um, is not actually the script in which Rashi would have written. Um, Rashi was, uh, lived in, uh, was sort of on the Franco-German border. He would not have written in what's this script, which is a Sephardic uh, Spanish or Iberian semi-cursive. Um, so I can talk for ages from the print history perspective of it, but I won't. Um, but yes, so there are, there are Sephardic um, materials, uh, Sephardic, Sephardic hands in the Geniza. Yes, yeah, we actually have a hashtag for Rashi script as well. Oh, okay, so that's why, tags. sorry. Yeah, no, it's exciting. And, and that was my little soapbox about Rashi script being called Rashi script. And <laughs> trying to explain that distinction has come up in the past and I haven't had a succinct way, so that is really wonderful. <laughs> Um, when transcribing some letter shapes are ambiguous, but can only be one of a small set, like Samach versus final mem, do you have a way to show ambiguity and letter possibilities? So we don't have a way to show ambiguity. Um, we ask you to select the one that is, uh, makes the most sense to you, whether it's visually or if you're reading the text and you can understand it. 
Um, and we do have some varieties. So we know uh, Final Mem is available in some keyboards, but not in all keyboards, depending on if we had examples of it. Um, so if there is a, a particular form that you're looking for, flipping through the keyboards will allow you to select it. Um, but because of the fact that we are comparing transcriptions over uh, between people, we will have sort of those possibilities, we expect those possibilities to come up in the transcription. So we'll be able to say, oh, this person thinks it might be this letter, whereas this person thinks it might be this one. Um, so no ambiguity on an individual level, but we expect it on a crowdsource level. Else. We had said that we're not going to start transcribing until two, so we'll we'll continue taking questions. Or, you know, if you want to walk away and take a break, <laughs> you're welcome to do that too. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna hold off until two to start the actual transcription. Oh, here, do we, can we have a crib sheet of all the keyboards or alphabets at once to help in choosing? Yes, there is a way within the interface and I can, I can talk about that when we go through the transcription interface, but you can select and view all the crib sheets at once. Um, we also have a handy dandy sheet that gives you an example of all the keyboards that we've created. So that was created by my predecessor, Lauren Newman Eckstein, um, that shows you all the variety that we've identified within the Ganesa. So that's separate from the project of somebody, I mean, from a paleographical perspective, what you guys have done with the keyboards is just incredible. Um, and I can see that being used in many other contexts, not just for the Geniza. So is that, is that available as well as a PDF? Yeah, we have it as a PDF on our GitHub. Oh, great. Okay. Um, maybe could you uh, add the link when when you have a moment. We, yeah, I can advice. do that. Um, someone asks if anything of historical significance have been, has been found. Um, yeah, there have been some really uh, fascinating things. So I believe um, one of the oldest Haggadah in existence has been found within the Geniza and we've identified it within the project. Um, so that was really exciting. Um, there have been some really fascinating examples of binding of various uh, codices or various books within the collection. Um, there was a conversation sometime last year where we found a uh, binding that was done in a corner, which is really, I guess, unique uh, for these materials. Um, and uh, we've been able to go into like specific uh, marriage contracts or ketubah and discuss uh, particular conversations. So what is happening in this situation, um, which is really unique. So getting married just before uh, a major holiday um, and trying to decipher different calendars. Um, so I think on, on small levels, we've found some things that are really of historical significance and are really interesting to scholars. You know, as far as binding, we have uh, one of our Geniza fragments is actually, it's almost like a notepad where the binding is at the top and you lift it up oh, okay. uh, like you would a notepad. So that's that's one of the sort of interesting binding, binding pieces that I know I've encountered. Um, when transcribing, should we dis decide on one keyboard per fragment or is it okay to flick through many scripts or keyboards? It is definitely okay to flip through many scripts and keyboards if it helps you identify what you're looking at. Um, so you typically, uh, typically a scholar is only writing in, or a scribe is only writing in one script, but if there are scripts that are easier for you to read um, and easier for you to find what characters you're looking for, use that. Okay. Um, somebody, uh, when did the project start? Yeah, so the project launched on Xenoverse in August 2017. Um, I want to say like one of the first few days of August 2017, and we started working on the project about a year before that. And we launched our transcription interface uh, March, 2019. Somebody asked about Judeo-Arabic. What is that? So I can take that one. Um, yeah. so there, are many, there are many Jewish vernaculars. Jews spoke usually um, Hebrew for, mostly for ritual or religious purposes. Um, but the language that they actually spoke was usually a version of the land in which they lived. Um, so there's Judeo-Arabic, which was a mix of, uh, he uh, of Jewish, Hebrew, and Arabic. 
Um, but also Judeo-Italian, Ladino is Judeo-Spanish, Yiddish, many of you may be familiar with, that. that's more of a Germanic um, slash Slavic, depending on where the Yiddish is from. Um, uh, but the, the, what makes it Judeo is usually that it's usually in Hebrew characters. So a work can be mostly 98% Arabic, but because it's in Hebrew characters, it's called Judeo-Arabic. So that's, a, that's an important distinction there. Um, any known authors that have been found? Um, yes, there are lots of them. Uh, Michelle might be able to, to talk about who they are, um, but I know um, Rashi and Maimonides, you have... Um, well, Maimonides, I mean, we say <laughs> in the Geniza is, is actually, was, this was known before the, the scribes of the Cairo Geniza project, but Maimonides' major um, coda, of major legal text, the Mishneh Torah, um, was found, his own draft of the work was found in the Geniza, and that's um, split between Cambridge and JTS, I believe. But you can go in and you can actually see Maimonides' thought process, what words he crossed out as he was writing this major, this was, this was the first major codex of Jewish law. Um, and it's a, it's a hugely important work. And this was actually his own hand, his own work. Um, many of Maimonides' uh, documents were found there. Letters that he wrote, there's, there's one at JTS that I know that's a, um, it was a letter for a charity collector, and basically it was, he, he handed the letter to the charity collector who was going around the known Jewish world, and he said, I approve this guy, he's collecting for a legitimate purpose, signed Moshe ben Maimon, which is Maimonides. So he was doing like regular rabbinic duties too. He wasn't just this major, huge philosopher, scholar, um, rabbi, etc., doctor. So um, that's, that's a big one. Um, but some, some of the earlier ones are really important as well. Um, rabbis from the Gaonic period, so shortly after the Talmud was codified, so Sadia Gaon, um, a lot of, there, there have been quite a few really important works as well from that period. Um, I don't know if you've talked, ah, can't remember his name, the, uh, the priest who converted to Judaism. Do you know? Oh, I don't think I know that one. No. Oh, so this is one actually in the um, talking about uh, to Western Western scripts. Um, I cannot remember his name right now. Um, maybe somebody you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this was a this was a priest, an Italian priest who converted to Judaism and fled Italy because he would have been killed by the church um, for his heresy. And he wrote a poem that was a, like a Thanksgiving poem. Um, it was actually a song, but he wrote it with uh, musical notes, which Jews did not use, but because he was cha trained in the church, he actually used the musical notes that would have been used in, um, in, ch in church chanting. So it's the, it's, the only, it's the earliest form of musical notation um, known in, in Jewish culture. Um, just, I'm sorry, I apologize, Phyllis. We didn't answer, the question was about Judeo-Arabic was um, if you sort Judeo-Arabic as Hebrew because of the script or as Arabic because of the content? Yeah, great question. So we are asking people to sort by script. So we asked them for, uh, so it would be sorted as Hebrew. Um, how did you advertise or get the word out to people who might be interested in helping to transcribe? Yeah, great question. So we work with Zooniverse, which is, I believe, the largest crowdsourcing um, collaborative project uh, on the internet. They have over 2 million users. So being able to be connected to Zooniverse allows us to have sort of a built-in group of people to advertise with. Um, we've done a lot of work connecting with Geniza scholars so that they can work with their students and graduate students on the project. Um, working within um, Jewish studies programs across the country. Um, so we have scholars like uh, Dr. Marina Rustow, who uh, received uh, a MacArthur Genius Grant for this project. And so when she goes around and talks about it, she always advertises the project to people that she's working with. And then one of the things that I've done since joining uh, Judea KPH at Penn is working within community groups. So I did a presentation at Princeton and with um, the Jewish Center, Center in Princeton, um, working with communities there. I've done a couple of presentations in local synagogues talking about the project. So uh, really trying to get out to people who um, know some Hebrew at least, um, who might be interested and who have um, personal and historical connections who will be really interested in the topic as well. 
what kind of drawings have been found in the fragments? Yeah, so we actually had a Zooniverse volunteer last year who went through all the tags on the project and um, put together a spreadsheet of every Geniza fragment that has some kind of doodle or drawing on it. Um, and some of them are really abstract and you can't tell necessarily what they were, uh, but some of them are really beautiful. There are particularly a lot of birds. Um, so bird imagery, whether it's because of stories that are written on the pages that you're looking at or um, just doodling alongside. Um, you find a lot of uh, manicules, um, which Michelle might be able to talk about. Bird the manicule. Yeah. Um, manicules were used throughout manuscripts. Um, Emily could talk about it. Emily <laughs> Rendy could talk about it as well. Um, the the manicules are these lovely little fingers pointing at, that's why I did this, pointing at the text. Um, you'll find it in many manuscripts um, where something is particularly important. The scribe or potentially a later user or an illustrator would just put a little hand doing exactly this, saying, focus on this piece of text. Um, I recently saw one in a Hebrew manuscript in a prayer book that included um, the Hallel, which is the Thanksgiving prayer, which is said for all sorts of different things. Um, but it included, it, it had the manicule at a portion that is sometimes left out to say, hey, I know when you usually say this prayer, you leave this out. But, but remember that now at this time, it was actually on Passover, you should, you should remember to say it. So it was, it, it's to remind people uh, of the importance of a particular text. Yeah, and we'll find we find a lot of nature drawings, so particular animals. I know scorpions are really popular um, for volunteers to find. Um, anything nature, plants, you have some architectural drawings. So there's a wide range of things that you find. Um, it was thank you, Jonathan. It was it was Obadiah, the the name ah, okay. of the yeah the uh, the priest who converted to Judaism, um, who wrote this beautiful uh, song. Of, of Thanksgiving for his uh, salvation in, when he arrived in Egypt. What is the significance of the seals in Arabic texts? Yes, so seals tell us that this is probably a legal document um, that is from the, uh, the, the government or the community that it's in. So the seals will also help us put a date on when the fragment is coming from um, because a seal is typically uh, uh, personalized or specific, specific to the government at that period. And, and thank you again to Jonathan for including the link. There's a link to uh, in the chat for, for Obadiah's um, manuscripts. There's actually a website that's been made around him and his work. Um, so you can see that in the chat. Um, somebody asked, were the 300,000 fragments written in Cairo or is the Geniza a collection of manuscripts from different regions? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I don't believe they were all written in Cairo. So some of them are coming from outside and they're coming from around the Mediterranean region. Um, and some of them we can't actually identify whether or not they were written in Cairo. Uh, but no, they're coming from a variety of places and all being placed within the Geniza. Yeah, and, and one of the things, I mean, I, I'm not sure if Goitan, I, I, I know that Goitan addresses this actually, excuse me, in the Mediterranean society. But there was a huge, because of the location of Cairo, sort of between East and West, um, there were many, many merchants who were passing through on their way to the East, to the Silk Road. And you have, um, there was a fiction book actually that was written uh, based on based on a merchant's travels um, and the Cairo Geniza. Um, but the, there was, um, so there are many letters that are written particularly from traders who are going from West to East or east to west uh, with with silk and other other materials that were constantly um, passing through Cairo. So you have you have many letters that are going that are coming from farther east in particular uh, that are passing through. So it's not locally based uh, by any means. I mean, there's a lot from Fusta from Old Cairo, but there's also a tremendous amount of material from other places. Um, the manuscript with the Halal manicule, I'll have to pull it up. It's a Columbia manuscript. It's not a, that's not a Geniza manuscript. Um, I'll see if I can, I'll, I'll see if I can pull up the call number and I'll, I'll send it in the chat. Um, the book, I actually have it, uh, yes, in an antique land. Um, I believe it's, no, it's not fiction. I'm sorry. 
it's a combination of his historical research into the Geniza. He was he was interested in finding um, an Indian slave who had traveled to the Middle East. So he traveled with the merchant and he found documents related to this person in the Geniza. So the title of the book is In an Antique Land and the author is Amitav Ghosh, uh, G-H-O-S-H. Um, and it's that, I actually have this book because um, I was sent it to read for my, for when I started as an undergraduate, um, we were supposed to have a, a reading group on this book. And then um, I didn't end up reading it, but I can't remember why. <laughs> so I still have it, um, <clears throat> but it's sort of ironic. Um, anything about G Benjamin of Tudela? In the Geniza, that's a that's a really interesting question. I know he talks about Cairo, but yeah, I I don't know anything off the top of my head, but that does not mean that there isn't. Um, and there are there are definitely places I can look for that information um, when we when we break off. So I will uh, add it to the chat if I do find something for you. Okay, um, here is the manuscript. Of course, I didn't cite. Okay, I'm gonna have to look. I'm gonna have to look more. I didn't. <laughs> I tweeted about this manuscript with the manicure, but I didn't cite the call number, which I'm usually, I usually try to be better about. Um, but so I, I'm gonna keep searching. Sorry. Um, I think adding to Louise's point on um, books about other people in uh, books about the Cairo Geniza that are fiction and nonfiction. Um, so for fiction, The Last Watchman of Old Cairo by uh, Michael David Lucas um, involves the Cairo Geniza in terms of his research, but also within the text. Um, and I know a lot of people have found out about the project through um, reading that book and then wanting to learn more about it. Um, and then Sacred Trash by Adina oh, Hoffman yeah. and uh, Peter Cole mm -hmm. um, is another really popular introduction to the history of the Cairo Geniza. Yes, Guide to the Perplexed is another one, uh, Dara Horns. Oh, yeah. Um, Eric Harvey's question, does one particular rite predominate among the manuscripts or do you find different traditions represented? Um, there are definitely different traditions represented. Um, I do not know exactly which ones are represented. Um, but I think it's difficult because a, because a lot of the materials that I focus on are fragmented. It's hard to identify exactly what tradition or right they're coming from. Um, David has a question. Do you ever find important fits in auction catalogs? Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by fits here, but if we're finding... Like joins. Yeah, in terms of joins, I think they have appeared, although it's pretty rare, um, especially with uh, Geniza fragments, as Michelle was saying, a lot of people want to say they have Cairo Geniza fragments. And so there's a lot that has to go in from a researcher's perspective of, of really trying to identify and confirm that it's from there. Um, and then in terms of joins, I don't know of any examples that have been uh, made that way, um, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Why or how do the fragments end up at different locations, university, universes, collections? <laughs> um, it's a really good question. And a lot of it is um, not so simple. So, I mean, there were once, so there were the two sisters, the Taylor sisters who found, who initially, were the first ones to publicize the Cairo Geniza and they brought this information to Solomon Schechter. 
Um, and then Salomon Schechter and, and the ethics of these are of this is is there to discuss. Went to Cairo, bagged up all this stuff, and sent it over to Cambridge. And then Salomon Schechter got a job at the Jewish Theological Seminary in America, and he took all of his favorite fragments and he took them with him. And so they're at JTS now. So a lot of these materials sort of moved around in different ways. I mean, it was part of this sort of uh, late 19th, early 20th century, people were discovering material and bringing them into collections um, where they now are. There, are. there are all sorts of discussions that can be had about you know, whether materials would have survived. There was recently, um, some of you may have seen that there was recently, there's still material in that synagogue and there was a, there was a medieval Bible manuscript that was, that was found sort of on a shelf there just a few months ago. Um, and, you know, all of these, the, the questions of where, of what should be, what may, might have happened, I think, I think it's easier for us to say, well, let's focus on just making them available very, very broadly and, and putting them out there in the most accessible way um, without trying to, to grapple with some of these, some of these big, big other questions of uh, former ownership. Um, versus where they are now. Um, but a lot of them, like JT, the bulk of JTS's collection came from, Geniza's collection came from Elkin Nathan Adler, who was a collector of his own right. And he went to Cairo because he heard about this cache and he took home um, hundreds, uh, tens of thousands of fragments. And now that's, this is the ENA collection at, uh, at JTS. And this was because it was donated to them. So they, that's how they received their materials. They came in, in many different ways. Um, I gave you the story of Columbia's, but similarly, I think Penn has a Penn has a story similar to JTS, where Penn the collection at Penn started as Dropsy College, which was a Jewish college. Um, it was incorporated into the University of Pennsylvania in the '90s, um, but until then, it was a standalone college. And so, because it was a Jewish college, its scholars were traveling to to um, to Cairo and we're working on these manuscripts and so they, they got them from various places as well. Um, in an earlier slide of the di diorama, there was a 10 pointed Magin David, is that unusual? I think they meant a 10 pointed star because the Magin David is, is only six pointed. Um, so I believe it is unusual, but I don't, um, I don't know the specific significance within the diorama. So that would be a question for the, uh, for the museum. How old can the fragments be? So I think that as the oldest are 10th century or 9th? So the oldest are 9th century. The majority fall between the 10th and the 13th centuries. And I've just put in the link to the manuscript I mentioned that has the manicule. The images there actually don't show the manicule. Um, I don't think I can upload an image, um, but but the, if you if you if you Google manicule, you'll see many many different examples of of these hands. But that's the manuscript that I mentioned. It's a it's a Mahsara prayer book for for um, for all the holidays for year round from Rome. That includes that. Um, somebody asked if the Geniza is now empty. Oh, good question. I don't actually know if they've kept the Geniza at Benazir Synagogue empty. I assume, uh, I assume not, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, given that they just found this manuscript on a shelf, um, as the article described, it's possible that there is still material there. I think it's, I don't think it's as easy to sort of take the stuff home with you anymore. <laughs> um, I, they, they frown on that. So don't try to do that. Um, but yeah, the, I, I, there must be, I don't, I don't know, but I do know that they did just recently find something there. Yeah, I think the other really interesting thing about the Cairo is that um, so the fragments that are really early, so these 9th century and 10th century materials, actually come from the previous Benazir synagogue that was on the same site. So they moved all the materials from one Geniza into the new Geniza. Um, and then the, the current Benazir synagogue is the third building on that site. And um, so they've moved these materials over and over. Which is interesting because you would think that they would have buried them at that point, but I guess they 
we're not <laughs> going to bury them. Right. Um, which is which is one of the the more typical ways that people would uh, deal with Ganesa. Um, I I see we're at at a, a little after one. So do you want to? Should we move into the transcription? Yeah, so um, you can continue to ask questions and we can answer them after we go through this. Um, but I'm just going to give an overview of how to transcribe on the site. Okay. All right, so the first step is to go to our website, scribesofthecairoganiza.org. You can also access it uh, through going through Zooniverse if you're a Zooniverse user and you know how to get through the projects page. Uh, but this will bring you to our custom front end site. Um, so I'm just going to have it up for a little bit longer in case people need to uh, spell it out. Um, but it'll bring you to our homepage. Um, the unique thing about our homepage that we launched in March uh, of last year is that it is also available in Hebrew and Arabic. One thing that was really important to our project team, um, some of who are based in Israel, is that we wanted people whose la uh, languages are the languages of the Geniza to be able to access the site through uh, their language. Um, and we know definitely a lot of people uh, use those interfaces, which is really exciting. Um, so that's gonna bring you to our homepage right here. So this black bar up at the top refers to Zooniverse, so where our site is hosted. Um, so only click on those if you're trying to get back to Zooniverse. Otherwise, we're going to focus on this toolbar down below towards the right. Um, and if you're looking at this interface in a different language, these uh, toolbars and things are going to be flipped. So if I'm talking about something on the right in English, it might be on the left in Hebrew or Arabic. Um, I believe because we're presenting in English, everyone um, is going to be using the English interface, but just in case uh, if you're not. Um, so if you are, this is optional, but if you are a Zooniverse user and you want to register, you can do that up here in the corner where it'll say sign in. Um, the benefit of registering is it allows you to talk on our talk boards um, and it also allows you to save your progress or access your progress over time uh, and maintain everything under one username. Um, but if you don't want to register or sign in at this point, the next thing that you're going to do is select transcribe from the button uh, from up here and it'll ask you to choose a workflow. So you'll get this uh, menu right here. So the first option is phase one sort fragments. Um, I'm not going to walk through that interface today, but if you are not interested in transcribing, um, you're going to click on that. Or if you get frustrated with transcription and want to take a break, you can always go back to sort fragments from here and that brings you to a different workflow. Um, if you are transcribing with us and you're going to select Hebrew, the one that we have open for today is the Easy Hebrew Transcription. So you're going to click right there um, where it says Easy Hebrew. Or if um, you are transcribing in Arabic, you're going to move down here and select Easy Arabic. Um, these that are grayed out are coming soon in the future at some point. So once you select a workflow, you're going to come up on a screen like this. So to the right is your subject info toolbar. So that's going to give you information about the specific uh, fragment that you're looking at. Um, if it comes up with a fragment that you think is too difficult to transcribe, maybe you think this isn't Hebrew and I'm in the Hebrew workflow. Uh, maybe it's just too difficult for you to start with. It's hard to read. Just refresh the page um, and go through that same process we just went through of uh, selecting a new workflow. Um, and you can do that until you get to a fragment that looks easy enough that you're ready to start with. So once you do that, you have this subject info toolbar on the right um, where you can click uh, show crib sheet. So that'll show you all the keyboards that you want to start with. Show field guide. Uh, so that field guide has information for our, most of the frequently asked questions that we think you're going to have. Um, show tutorial. So anything that I'm talking about here in this presentation, or you know, maybe you just need a refresher on how to transcribe, you can select show tutorial. It'll walk you through that. Or if you want to flip to the other side of the page that you're looking at, you can select transcribe page reverse. Then over here on the right is the toolbar you're probably going to use most often. So you have options like zoom in, zoom out. Uh, you can rotate the page. You can invert colors, uh, so if it's particularly difficult for you to read, inverting the colors might help the letters stand out more. 
Um, you can reset the image to the way it started. So maybe you zoomed in way too much and you need to zoom out. You can always reset the image. And you're going to select this add transcription button once you've found a line that you want to start with. So you're going to click on add transcription. Um, and what's going to happen is uh, you'll move to the beginning of the line that you want to start with. So remember, Hebrew and Arabic are right to left languages. That means the line starts at the right side and ends at the left side of the page, um, which is, can be difficult for uh, people who are starting in English to recognize. So what you're going to do Oh, oh, there's a question about how side one, side two is determined. Um, and that is totally dependent on how the library decided and what was considered the uh, verso or the recto. Um, and Michelle might be able to talk a little bit more about that, but I don't know specifically for uh, all sometimes, of these. Sometimes you can tell based on if you can recognize some of the text. Um, also, you can tell, so if you look at this one, I would say that this is the recto. Um, they wrote recto at the top, so I'm glad to see that. Um, and that's because you see that the right side of the page looks like it's much straighter than the left side of the page. And so the right side of the page was probably where it was bound, whereas the left side was the loose pages. So that may have gotten a, um, a little bit damaged with use as you turn the pages. Whereas because the right side was in the binding, um, it would have stayed relatively straight. So in this case, that's that's probably how they did it. Um, but another way to look is if you can recognize any of the text, then sometimes you can see that the text actually continues on the other side of the page. So that's another way, another way to look at it. Great. Okay, so when you're ready to select a line, you're gonna move over here to add transcription. Um, and then you'll put a dot on the start of the line, so the right side of the line, and then a dot on the left side of the line. Um, once you've done that, this keyboard is automatically going to pop up. So if you put your two dots, but you put them in the wrong place, you can just cancel that transcription. It'll give you the option to delete it. Um, it's really sensitive, so be careful when you put down your dots. Um, but that'll establish for us on the back end, this is where the line ends and this is where the line begins. And we use that information because we know um, people aren't always gonna be exact with the, where the line is. Um, so we use a script that allows us to tell, okay, this is what we think the line is located on the page. And once you've done that, you have this keyboard box that pops up. So you're gonna enter your text content within the box. Um, and you can either use the uh, keyboard that is on screen, or if your keyboard is in Hebrew, you can also type it directly from your computer. Um, and you're going to do that just by clicking on specific letters. And then if you want to switch through to different keyboards, you can do what this, uh, this GIF is doing by clicking on the arrows and moving through. And you can always move back to the show modern characters if you uh, feel more comfortable going there. Um, and then up here are text modifiers. So we use these in cases where there's something that's going to happen um, sometimes really commonly, or we know there are examples and we wanna have ways of reading those in the transcription. So if someone has inserted text, so maybe there's a little caret above a word with additional text, you're gonna select insertion, and then you'll uh, have the text typed inside the insertion box. Or the same thing for deletion, if there's a word that's crossed out, you're going to type it in and then put it within deletion. If you're on a line and there are some characters, there maybe there's a hole in the middle of the line or you know someone's erased everything, um, there might be a hole, there might be a tear, something that it's really impossible for you to read or the page is physically damaged, you're going to select damaged for as many characters are there as there are um, issues. So if you think there are like two or three characters, you'll select damaged. If there's a drawing in the middle of the line, so maybe there is a star, um, you might have uh, other small doodles in the middle of a line occasionally, you can just select drawing. And um, if there's a grid, you're gonna select grid and then type your information that way. Um, and then if there is the divine name within a line and you are not comfortable transcribing the divine name, you can always select this modifier. Um, and we have that as an option for people who aren't comfortable doing it. You don't have to do it if you recognize 
um, the divine name and, or if you don't recognize it, we're not so concerned, we'll be able to fix that on the transcription end. So once you have uh, done your transcription, you've selected done. So you've transcribed one line, maybe you've transcribed an entire page, congratulations. Whenever you're finished, you can go over here and select finished. It's gonna ask you usually two questions. It's gonna say, are you done transcribing this page? Which is yes. The second question is gonna be, has all of the text in this fragment been completely transcribed? So when you are transcribing a line, if the line is still active, it's green, but when it's done um, uh, and been totally transcribed by three people, it turns gray. For the cases of today and probably every time that you're gonna come to the website, uh, an entire fragment will not have been totally transcribed. So you should always be selecting, no, there is still text that has not been transcribed. Then you'll select done. Or if you're logged in and maybe you have a comment or a question about the page you're transcribing, you can select done and talk. Um, so that is my basic introduction. Um, I know there are some questions in chat that I'm trying to pull up. Um, so I mentioned the PDF with all of the scripts on one page. I can share that in the chat. Oh, you have it? Um, uh, if you have it, you can drop it in. I just found it. So I'm giving you a link to, uh, to GitHub, but there's an option to download on that page uh, all of the alphabets. So they're not as keyboards it's, and you just click download. I think that's the right one, right? Yep, Emma? that's the right one. Yeah, so if you, you go ahead in there and you can download the PDF, which lists a total of one, two, three, four. Almost 20 different scripts. Yeah, that sounds about right. More than 20, yeah. And they're created directly from fragments that are in the Geniza. So they are all examples of um, fragments that you might come across as transcribing. And I didn't create that chart, but my predecessor created that chart. Um, so there are only 26 characters, no matter which script is chosen. Um, I believe there is some variation, but it's supposed to match up with a with a U.S. North American keyboard. There's a standard Hebrew keyboard, so it goes on the same letters that it that a modern Hebrew keyboard would go. Um, so that also addresses the next question, which is, do you enter the transcription in modern Hebrew or in the keyboard script uh, that matches your doc? And no matter what, if you press those buttons on the keyboard, it'll show up in a modern square uh, uh, hand. Yes. Script. But yeah. Um, yeah, so it's the whole, the alphabet is the same, uh, George, in, in uh, no matter which script is, is chosen. Did you create, oh, you said, sorry, got that one. Ligatures, good question. Emily, what do you do about like Aleph Lamed uh, as one letter? Yes, so um, some of the custom keyboards have Aleph Lamed as an option, or uh, if you, so if you're not working with a Hebrew keyboard yourself, you can type it as two separate characters for now. But you're not, you're not distinguishing. We're not, yeah, we're not distinguishing. Okay. So yeah, Mark, when you're looking at a manuscript, you might, you'll want to flip through the scripts to see if you don't know Hebrew, you'll want to flip through the script so that you can see what matches the style of what you're looking at. So then you can identify the letters, hopefully. And oh, also another good point. So if you're going through a line and you're transcribing and there's one character that you just can't figure out what it is, you can type in a question mark instead. Um, so that'll show up as a question mark in our in, in your transcription.
Yeah. So Jen, it seems that they're not, they're not marking ligatures. So you're not going to mark it as such. Although I imagine if you wanted to put it in a talk board, Emily, you could do that to yeah, say, you can hey, always add it pointing there. it out that this is a ligature there, but at this point they don't have a marker for it. Mm -hmm. And then cut off letters was another question. Yes. So if you can make out what the letter is to the best of your ability, you can choose one or you can put that question mark in there. Or you can say it's damaged. So no, I can't make up what that character is because there's an issue on the page, whether it's cut off or some other issue. Dots on a line. Um, so if the dots are appearing sort of above or around the line, they are going to be um, some form of, uh, the word is escaping me, but cancellation being a simple. Yes, vocalization, yes. But I think, um, okay, go ahead. Yeah, um, but if it's like a period within the line, you can always type it on your computer. Is there another example you're thinking of? So what Emily is referring to is that in Hebrew, the vowels are actually separate uh, symbols that are either lines or dots, usually below the letters, but there is a Babylon, the Babylonian vocalization has the uh, letters above, the vocalization above the letters. So you might see it either way, depending on what the manuscript is. Um, somebody asked for a video of instructions for how to transcribe. Emily, could you drop that in the chat when you have a moment? Yeah, I will do that. For anybody that might, um, from an accessibility perspective, if you have any trouble typing, you can also raise your hand and we can unmute you to ask a question verbally as well. Um, or just if you don't want to type it or it's too hard to type, um, to explain it in typing, feel free to raise your hand. Um, vowels. You're, you're muted, Emily. Thanks about that. <laughs> um, so we don't ask people to transcribe vowels. Um, you can put that information in talk if you know it, but do not do the lines of vowels if you don't have it or you don't have a way to do it on your keyboard. And then again, we have that question of, of cantillation and trop. Um, so we address, we, we mentioned that earlier, um, but unfortunately there isn't a way to, to enter the trop at this time. It can be added in the talk boards if you want to add it, uh, if you want to note it um, separately. And just in case you don't see the chat, uh, Emily has added the link of the video of how to transcribe. Um, somebody wanted to ask if you can see others' transcriptions, and if so, how you comment on a possible error, or should people just be focusing on their own transcriptions? Yes, so focus on your own transcriptions. We do not currently have a way for you to be able to view other people's transcriptions. Um, I know some Zooniverse projects do allow that. It's something we've decided to just do one transcription at a time. So we're gonna stay on at this point, just feel free to, to go in yourself if you haven't yet and, and give it a shot. And then um, we're both here for any questions as you go. We're doing it together apart. This is one of these.
Will the video of this be posted online? Somebody wanted to, had some questions about the books. I should actually, the next question was chat. If you, if you press the three dots on the chat, um, you can save the chat and it'll be downloaded to your local computer so you can see the whole chat once you've signed off. Some, uh, are we gonna do an actual transcription or should everybody be doing it on their own? Um, you can be doing it on your own. I'm, I can pull up mine, but my Hebrew is very bad, so I feel bad trying to transcribe in front of people. Um, but if people would like, I can do that. Or um, the other question being, oh, will this video be online? So we are recording it and I will do some editing to have it. Um, but we also have a list of books, articles, uh, things that you can access to recommend on the talk boards of Zooniverse. Um, so there is a pinned thing there and I can share that link now as well. Um, so if you wanted to learn more about the Geniza, you wanna listen to some presentations, read some interesting things, uh, that's a question I get a lot. So I put together some really basic stuff for people. Um, maybe I'll go into the transcription because I've only gone onto the site maybe once or twice. And this way, I think I'll have questions and others will have questions. Sure. And we'll see. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I just pulled up this site. Okay, so I, sorry, let's start from step one. So C Scribes of the Cairo Geniza, and I want to transcribe, I could, at, at first I went here to transcribe it, I see that I can do it down here also. So I'm gonna do easy Hebrew, because I don't read Arabic. And it gives me this welcome page, telling me what I need to do. And we talked about all of these things, so I'm gonna go through them quickly. Although I'll probably regret it and have questions, <laughs> which I guess is kind of the point. All right, so what I want to do first is zoom in because this is really small. And okay, so I see that I'm working with, I think what you're calling a Byzantine script. To me, this is a kind of a Mizrahi script. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and add my transcription. So I'm going to start with line one. I already see that I'm going to have some issues. Okay, and here's my keyboard. I want to find a similar script to this. That was a little bit similar, but I'm going to see if I can find something that's even closer. Those lamids are different. Maybe just the first one. Um, let's let's go with this. So this was not planned. I have no idea. Uh, the, <laughs> sorry. Um, if anybody knows how to download the chat on iPad, maybe somebody can go into the chat and help George there. Okay, so what I'm seeing is, I need to move, keep moving you guys over. All right, so that first letter is maybe a tough, and then a lamed, which actually makes sense. There's a little abbreviation on the top. So I see that as an abbreviation for a Talmud Lomar, which is a standard abbreviation before a Talmudic quote. So again, I'm, I'm doing this just guessing with everybody else, but, um, and then I think maybe that's a pay, and then a Zion, but I'm not sure what that is. That also looks like it might be an abbreviation because of that dot on the top. And I'll continue with ma, so mem hey, bo, uh lil i want that to be uh lil mod even though so i have i have the lamed and the lamed and then a mem and a 
what looks to me like a race, but I don't think that makes sense. Um, so can I put a Dalid and then a question mark in parentheses because I put the letter in? Oops. Um, Emily, what do you think about that? Um, so you're asking whether to whether to put a question or whether to put the letter? Should I put if if should I put the letter that I think it is or should I put the question mark in? So I would put the letter that you think it is, but you can always put the question mark if you really aren't sure. Okay. And then it, I see that it's damaged. Yes. So there's that damaged mark. And then we have Aleha. And here's where knowledge of Hebrew can help. I think my, my keyboard is not great. Um, Miutar. Yeah. Uh, Lamdenu, Lamdenu. Thank you, Chaim. You think? Yeah. So, so okay. So somebody has suggested that this is Lamdenu, which includes the the damaged piece. So should I still mark that there's a damaged piece there, Emily? Yeah, I think you can still leave the damage there. Uh, Lilam Denu. So then I'm leaving this pigum, which, which means uh, damaged in Hebrew. Uh, and no markings for abbreviation or punctuation. Should I be marking that this is, should I put in a, like that, Emily, for the, that this is an abbreviation? No, you don't have to. You can just know. type it directly as is. Okay. So the answer to that question is no. Um, haya lo. Uh, this looks like Lomar, which would be a miss, well, a misspelling, because there should be an Aleph there. Um, le, I'm having a hard time with this one. Let's sonar, le, Lechvo, do you think? But what about this this stretching back? Lebachor is another suggestion. I'm still. I'm. St oh, that's a rare. Yeah, that's correct. That makes sense. So to somebody who is harming somebody. Um, because this this letter going backward to me is a tzadi, and that's why I think I have the wrong keyboard up because this tzadi looks very different. Um, and then legalut, legalut, ar, mita, which is not a word from aruta. We have a we have an embedded uh, pen cataloger that's helping me secretly. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting some. <laughs> Thank you, Chaim. Um, okay, so here I'm done my first line, and I'm gonna just do done. Yes. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Then I would move on to the second line. Yes. Yeah, so, and if you wanted to go back to your line for some reason, at any point, you can click on one of the, black, the dots and it'll pop right back up. Very nice, very nice. Uh, no continue transcribing, so done. I have to press done. If I exit out, it won't save my work. So. Right. Okay. Um, that's great. So let me try this invert colors. This is this is really great. Um, sometimes for manuscripts where there's damage, you can see. So that word that we were wondering about. Let's see if that helps us. Le, lam, denu, and then let's so rare. So you see how that that uh, that sadi going back over there is a lot clearer. That that extra uh, piece of the word going back. When you when you do it in the inverted, in the inverted colors. 
um, show previous marks. I'm not sure if that's um, so you can use it to, so it has the dots on the screen right now, but if you were trying to really focus on a line, um, you could hide all the previous line marks. Oh, if they're bothering you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm just looking on the other side of the page. So this is giving me information about the manuscript. It's currently at the Library of the Jewish Theological Seminary. I can go see that actual record if I want or I could make this go away. Um, and the tutorial is on every page. So if you have any questions, you can go back to the tutorial. Um, transcribe page reverse. Let's just see what happens. Oh, this is the other side of the page. Yes. So, yes. Okay, so this is the verso of that same page. And then I'm finished my line. So no, there's still text that has not been transcribed. And I'm going to do done and talk, but then it's going to ask me to log in, right? It, so it'll bring you to that page. And if you wanted to add a comment, you have to log in. Yes. Okay. But I can see that other people have been involved with this page and have worked, have done some work here. Is there a way to see what the conversations are? There are no yeah, comments. Yeah, so if there were comments, they would come up down here and you might be able to okay, see great. those. So you could see, you could then participate. Um, Emily, could you give us an example of of discussion of a discussion page? Yeah, let me pull up an interesting one. And there's the record at the Jewish Theological Seminary for the front. Yes, and so whenever we can, we link to um, the record of that of a specific library. Mm -hmm. And this is at Princeton because the Print the JTS fragments are currently at Princeton, or it's at Princeton because they have all the information about all the fragments? Um, because Princeton has uh, the information about the fragments. Okay. Because I know that um, at the moment, the materials are actually, the JTS fragments are at Princeton. Yes. So somebody asked about Aleph's in this alphabet. Um, let me, uh, I don't know if I can go back. Sorry, it's hard for me to go to different tabs because I'm sharing the screen. Here we go. I think I'm going to another, let's show the crib sheet. So this, this is an Aleph. If you look at, and, and it's just laid out on the screen the way it would have been, the way it's laid out on the keyboard. But you'll see the variety in olives. So this is um, from the Near East. This would, which looks very different than an olive, for instance, that you expect to see um, <clears throat> on a on a Torah scroll or or in a Western hand. Um, and you see that they they do they do vary. This actually looks, if you know script Hebrew, this looks like a cursive mem, but it's actually an olive. Um, and you have a lot of different examples. So that's that's showing all of the all of the letters at one time. So if you're not certain about something, you can go into the crib sheet and see any letters. So I guess you this is just Aleph. So you'd have to click in to see all of them. Yes. And yeah. And then by selecting the sentence script to keyboard, it'll send it to the keyboard for when you go and transcribe a line. Oh, nice. So if you're not sure which script, you can see them all at once so that then you can decide what you want to use. Yep. That's lovely. And I, so I have a conversation that I can pull up and share. Okay, let me stop so you can go ahead. Yeah. Um, so this one I use a lot in presentations because it's a fun one. It has a visual element that people like to comment on a lot of the times. So this person looked at this fragment. They noticed that it's a really uh, elegant, it's neat. There seems to be a decoration at the top, which was catching their eye. And um, so then someone commented out, it's a translation of a piyut um, that's used in Passover, um, which is coming up later this week. And so this person is reading it and they think it might be Ladino based on some of the words that they're reading. Um, and at the time we commented, it looks like that these animals are um, the animals that are mentioned in the song. So they're illustrated in the marginalia. So these are these uh, the animals and the images that they're drawing. 
And then we had more of a debate of, well, we think it's a dialect of Judeo-Persian or a related language. And so having a conversation about um, where that was coming from. So people working through, well, I thought it was this because um, of Do and Dinero, which um, are mostly used in romance languages. And then they're using the hashtag ask the experts, um, which we ask people to use if they're trying to get an expert's attention. Um, and then I go through those tags regularly and send them to researchers to answer. And so our moderator here says it's a good guess, um, but that word is actually really common throughout the Islamic word, uh, uh, world. And so he's doing some research in, and this is actually uh, a printed page rather than a written page. So it's probably from Baghdad or Mumbai. <laughs> this is somebody who's literally doing his dissertation on printed materials in North Africa. So. Yes, yeah, he's really excited. <laughs> he knows what he's talking about. Um, and then it goes and continues on. And then uh, we featured the conversation on our blog at one point um, and continues on. And so you have oh, more of the conversation. Crazy. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can see throughout here, we have the various um, hashtags that people use. So like illustration, doodle, um, nutsa, hagada. Um, someone else has linked to, so that we know this page is part of a collection of pages, so they've linked to the other one, um, which is really common. So we know on the back end that some of the pages are related, but there isn't always an easy way to do that in Xeniverse. So volunteers will say, and we know these pages go together. Um, yeah, so that's one example of conversations, but uh, we've had about 10% of the fragments in our project have been commented on at least once. And usually if there's one comment, there are going to be lots of comments. So. We're just having a gnome fan <laughs> yeah. in the comments. <laughs> So with sorting, maybe I should do a sorting also. Uh, if the vowel points were clearly added later on to the original text, does it count as an example of diacritic or not? That's a good question. We count it as an example of diacritics. So diacritics are on the page, um, which is what we're asking with that question. Um, you'll actually find in a lot of cases that um, diacritics and vowel points are being added after something is already written on the page. So that's pretty common. Um, I'd be curious to know how, how much later you actually think it is. But yes, they're usually added later. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Sure. So I can do some sorting. This is fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> I hope the rest of you are enjoying. Um, okay, so I'm going to the main page and I'm pressing sort fragments. And let's see what happens. You do not need any language expertise for this. So I am identifying just the script. And I'm swiftly going through the instructions. In what script, okay, wait, let me move you all out of the way. In what script is this text written? So this is clearly Hebrew to me. A formal or an informal style? This looks informal to me uh, for a few reasons, but I, this writing on the side, somebody wasn't being super careful. I'm also seeing Arabic here, actually. So let me go back. And is there, here's the both option? Because yes. that right here is definitely Arabic. I didn't look, I looked at it too fast. So let's try again. It is informal. Uh, next, evidence of the following. I do not, I do see evidence of binding. That's modern though, that, that awful tape. Yeah, so we're, so that's not the binding that we're looking for in this case. Okay, you're looking for early bindings. Yes. Um, justified margins-ish? I mean, on, on, on this end, do you want, I mean, does that? Yeah, if you think it looks like justified margins, you can select it. Even if it's only on one side? Mm hmm Okay. And top corner page where definitely? And it's been, it looks like it's been conserved. So it's a little hard to see, but you can see here where the conservation added pages, added paper to the top of the page to, to firm it, to hold it down. 
you can see it a little bit better here with the um, with this clear um, material. Next, use the point to tools to click on visual characteristics as they are listed below. If there's more example than one example, okay. So do I see any colons? I do not. Nor do I see di diacritics. I do see diagonal or perpendicular text. So I'm just gonna draw, I click on it or do I draw, am I drawing something around it? Um, you okay. can click on it and it should appear. Ah, okay. And am I making this big enough to cover the whole thing or just anywhere on, on it? You can just select anywhere on it. Okay. Um, so I've drawn that text and then no seals. And now I am done. And it's gonna give me another one. So this is, this is, I mean, this is compared to the other one, this is like something I can do just in my spare time as I, I just wanna look at, I mean, th this is, <laughs> you know, before I, one of the reasons I knew I wanted to become a librarian was because I like, I like old stuff. And this is a great example of just, oh, you wanna hang out with some manuscripts. So here, spend an hour or so just looking at different manuscripts. Sounds, to me, this is like really fun. <laughs> I don't know about everybody else. All right, and I'm if you start. click on the, the eye image um, when you're sorting, that'll give you all the information about the fragment. So um, uh, this one here? Yeah, that one. Okay, so it's from Manchester. It's giving me the, these are call numbers? Yes. Numbers? And then it'll give me the link at Manchester. So if I want to see their metadata, I can look and see what they have to say about this particular manuscript. And they already have actually a lot of information. So if you want to find out more about the manuscripts, I imagine this is not guaranteed, but if some institutions have done pretty extensive work into cataloging their Ganesa fragments. So that's nice to see. I'm gonna go ahead and stop that share. Yeah, somebody says it could be addictive, I agree.
Okay, we have about five more minutes. So just if anybody has any questions before we sign off. And we'll be able to, so we'll send out um, an email after, after this probably tomorrow with a list of any of the links we've shared today, um, the video of this presentation and anything else that I think can be helpful that's come up based on the conversations here. But thank you all for coming. It's been really great to, to be able to chat with Michelle and just to be able to answer questions and go through everything here. It's been really wonderful just to see the, the, how many people from really all over the world are involved in this project. It's, it's really amazing. And initially, I mean, this was supposed to be an in-person transcribe-a-thon, you know, at a few institutions, um, but locally based. And I feel like in this way, we were able to expand it to the world, which is really kind of awesome. Yeah. So many of you know, have been working on this for so long. I mean, you guys, you guys are experts, certainly more than I am. Yeah, we actually, we did a survey of our community um, in December. So we have people from at least 27 countries who have participated in the project. Um, uh, yeah, all over the world, really exciting. And lots of, lots of people who have various uh, investment in why they're participating. So for some people, it's just to see something new that you wouldn't expect to see anywhere else. Um, for some people, it's really to figure out and think about what they can learn from these materials. Um, some people are interested in learning Hebrew, and so they're doing this alongside as they're learning. Um, yeah. So lots of different reasons. Um, Smadar asks if the piece she has, she believes, is from the Bible and she, she wants to note the source. Should she add that to the talk? Yes, yeah, if you can. So Leora Lipkin says, I think it would be great if more undergrads participated. I would love to help start something for undergrads interested in this project. And I will say that I did see some faculty on the talk. Um, shout out to Professor Levy. Um, and and I, think this is, I think this is a great opportunity to bring in undergrads, uh, especially now as, as faculty are looking for online projects. So reach out to Emily for more. Yeah, I can actually, I have a uh, slide in my presentation that gives my email and information. So I can pull that up. And yeah, uh, we're, we're all working at home at Penn Library. So if you need someone to jump into your class or to talk about the project, um, or just looking to stay connected, I am always happy to to answer questions uh, and help people participate. Um, so yeah, so that is my information. How to undo a cursor. So if you have um, put down 
uh, dots for transcription. If you uh, cancel the transcription, so delete it entirely, um, then you can put down a new line. All right, we're at two. So thank you everyone for joining. Thank you so much, Emily, for coordinating. Um, and I really was so glad to be able to take part in this. I'm gonna unmute everybody. So if you wanna <laughs> say thank you or <laughs> just mention anything. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, post, for this meeting, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and, and close us down and hopefully we'll see each other on the talk boards. Yes. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.